Learning Lab where we talk about how to make better videos and how to design and communicate better through video. I'm joined today by Mohsen Memon, a game designer who specializes in creating learning games. Welcome, Mohsen. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's exciting. This morning, I'm thinking of video games, which you know, typically focus on you playing a central hero and every hero has an origin story. So take us on that small journey. In a nutshell, um, I grew up, you know, acting and, uh, and that played a, played a pivotal role in my uh, understanding of uh, what goes into character building and what goes into really telling a, a, a compelling story. And then I moved from there into, into playing a lot of games, you know, and, and as a young adult, I play a bunch of games and I played a different range of games. It wasn't until much later that I realized that those games had played such a significant part in my understanding of the world around me. You know, games like Civilization helped me understand history and what, what it takes to, to grow a, a, an economy. I learned about business, I learned about virtues and values and things like that. And, uh, and, and now I think all of that comes together in the form of me uh, integrating that into learning to create more meaningful and impactful learning experiences. Something you mentioned there is, you know, you have to go on your own game journey. And then once you have an understanding about how those games work, you can start to build that design and, and really use it to inform learning, give people experiences and maybe teach them something along the way. And in our case, in L&D, it's how do we drive behavior change? So I'm really interested to get your thoughts on how we end up with that impact and performance at the end of designing these learning experiences. So I think to kick us off, I want to talk a little bit about where games and gamification started. I think for me, it started back in 2010 with Jane McGonigal's, you know, reality is broken. And there was this wave of, of gamification and learning. And there was this huge wave of apps really thinking about leaderboards, point systems, badges, quizzing and competitions. And now it's over 12 years later. And we know that when you take that rushed approach to gamification and gaming elements and you apply them to learning experiences kind of as an add-on, it's not as effective. So even if the game design is great, then you're playing the game elements as opposed to mastering new learning or, or uh, hitting uh, performance objectives. So can you walk us through how you think about games and how you Im embed games within the larger learning experiences? Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that it, you've got to have your own game experience or your own game journey and and this is part of my problem with uh designers who are just slapping points badges and leaderboards to things you know and you've got to have a a felt sense of what the game feels like any game for that matter and that's one of the reasons i recommend to to a lot of designers to play more games you know play meaningful games games that really shift something inside of you when you play them you know i, I remember playing final fantasy 12 long long time ago. i've played that game many times since then and and that, you know that game shifted something inside me when i played it as the main character of this boy who's just sort of who's just trying to find his way around the world that he lives in then goes on to saying that i want some adventure i want to become a sky pirate and then goes on from that and finding meaning his epic meaning if you will which is bigger than himself and it's so beautiful to see that journey that that individual started with a very self-centered view of the world around him and then slowly moved and moved and moved and by the end of the game he was saving the world he was doing something that was far greater than themselves and i think i think most games do something of that effect and understanding that you know nuance and those are things that are that's why i said those are things that are i think felt sensed of the game experience that a lot of times you cannot bypass that because if you try to bypass that, then what you're going to end up with are just this, this superficial understanding of what game, you know, design theory tells you or Nash's equilibrium tells you about. And then as a result of that, you've got very broken mechanics that don't necessarily fit with each other. And as a result, again, you've got uh, uh, an environment of game that isn't fun. I think something you touched on there is the felt game experience. You know, how do you bring that felt game experience or how do you get people to interact with those challenges in something that might be shorter? For example, like, a, a, a you know, if you're doing uh, leading people in a workshop through a game experience, how do you get them to have those experiences without, you know, uh, taking the, the, the months that it might take you to play, you know, Final Fantasy VII or something like that? Yeah, yeah, no, spot on. And that's, I think that's the point of the, of the hour because people don't have time. 
Mm-hmm. And so how do we engage people and how do we enable learning in a rapid sort of environment? And within that environment, within those two hours of time when, a, when an individual steps into the game, having no context of the game environment, they not only learn how to play the game, they understand the mechanics of the game, but they form a strategy on how to play the game and then they execute that strategy as well. So what I've been able to do with a game like Evive, the leadership game, is I've been able to take what happens in the span of a year in a project with all the ups and downs, with all the highs and lows, all the hits and misses of the project, uh, all the people coming on board, all the disappointment of people you love leaving from the team are condensed into a 45 minute gameplay. And then you can come out of that gameplay and reflect on that experience to say, okay, those behaviors were great. And these behaviors are something that we might need to improve or we might need to change or we might need to do something better with. But Mm -hmm. I think at the core of all of this is autonomy. How do you instill autonomy in a player who is stepping into that room? And it's about teaching them how to play that game. The faster you're able to enable a learner to become active, and what I call that activating a learner, the faster you're able to activate a learner, the more powerful and meaningful that learning experience will be. Do, do you have an example of, without giving too much away of, of a vibe, of an example where a participant starts to make that shift towards autonomy or that shift towards, you know, maybe a building a new skill or, or having a, being able to demonstrate a new behavior in the game? So it's interesting that the new behavior doesn't necessarily show up until much later in the gameplay, maybe mm-hmm. not even in the first round. It might actually show up in the second round of the gameplay. Uh, but I do know exactly where the shift from being a, a recipient of information to a giver of instruction to other members takes place. And and it happens, uh, and this was a struggle for me. When I first built the game, one of my biggest challenges was how do I teach this game in a simple and effective way? And mm-hmm. ultimately I boiled down to three words and, I, and I, I, I broke the entire game down and I said, there are only three things that you have to do in the game. You've got to harvest your land, you've got to trade your resources, and you've got to mine Movillennium. And I showed the connection between each of these three things. And I showed them in the game while them doing it, how Mm -hmm. to do each of these steps. When people make the connection, when people understand that, okay, if I harvest my land, I will generate resources. With those resources, I'll make money. With that money, I'll buy a mine so that I can mine Movileniums. When they make that connection in their head, they're on their own. And they're Mm -hmm. able to really take that idea, that concept, and, and do phenomenal things with it. What Mm -hmm. comes up as learning is a byproduct. You know, in essence, you're just playing the game. But Mm -hmm. what comes up as learning is how did I do that? Did I overpower somebody in the process of doing that? Did I allow space for the introverts in the room to speak up as well? Uh, Did I uh, communicate my vision? Did people resonate with me or was I just bulldozing the whole time? So, so something that uh, interesting that you mentioned as well, and it seems like is, is really key to designing a full learning experience is that reflection or making sure that people grasp, you know, this is what happened in the game space. How does this translate to real world? So if the goal of learning is performance, how do you ensure that the game events or the game design translates to performance? W- what do you walk people through or how do you conduct that process? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very very important part of the learning experience, and mm-hmm. uh, it it starts with the objective. You know, why are you running the game? Why are you facilitating this game experience? And with clarity beforehand, as a facilitator, you've got to come up with um, what I like to call reflective questions, because if you don't have that reflection component, if you don't have the the space for people to think about what they've done it would have just been another game right? mm-hmm. that they play. It was entertaining. It was a lot of fun, but it didn't necessarily yield to any kind of real outcome. And, and that's one of the reasons it's so important for us as facilitators and designers of game ecosystems for learning specifically, uh, for us to have clarity in what are we really trying to drive 
from this experience. As an example, we've used Evive for communication. We've used mm -hmm. it for collaboration, for a number of leadership skills. We've also used it for resilience and emotional intelligence or coaching, right? Now, what's the difference between all of these? Uh, the gameplay essentially remains the same. What really changes is as a facilitator, when we, when we touch upon the different kinds of aspects of the game to, to get people to talk about their experience from that lens. So imagine, imagine changing the lens and, and like, a, like almost like a kaleidoscope, right? You change the lens, you change the filter, and now you're looking at that same environment from a, in a different shade altogether. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, really important um, for us to prepare questions, reflective questions to guide people through and, and then draw insights from that. But originally, I was talking to the project manager, the head of project management um, at a very large communication devices company. And, and his problem statement to me was, um, you know, our leaders are, are competing with one another uh, because they've got quotas to meet. And there are multiple design centers around the world. And these leaders, the project leaders, they take these projects that they cannot fulfill. And many a times, individually, it doesn't affect them. But as a, as a whole, it affects the organization's reputation. And what, so I said, what would be a good behavior that you'd like to see as a result of this, you know, coming out of this? Let's say we, we design the game and, and it, 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 gets, um, it gets well received and, and everything. What would be your take home? What, what would be something that you want people to change in how they behave? And he said, I would, all I would want is that people talk to one another before they take on a project that they bid on a project and and that they stop competing internally and they realize that they're all part of the same team that even though they individually may not be meeting their respective quota the whole as organization as a whole is benefiting from that project going to a design center that will actually be able to fulfill that requirement and from that came the offer systems in evive there in the game there are these offers that come up on the screen and the moment one player accepts the offer, it goes away for everybody. So inherently, what it does is it causes competition amongst players with one another. But if players talk to one another and, and align with one another, who's going to take this offer based on who has the necessary resources, you see a world of shift and, and difference in the way that the players, one, play with each other, and two, uh, receive benefits from that offer fulfillment and and all of that together enhances the tribe value which is the reputation in of that tribe in the game environment so so all of that that's just a game engine right the game mechanic element uh, for us to be able to bring the points home we've got to be able to talk about it after the fact so when they played the game the first time we saw that the players were competing against one another they were fighting for these offers the same behaviors that were prevalent in the real life environment. But when we played the game, we saw the same stuff happen and we created a dialogue around it. We said, what happened here? And people said, well, we were fighting for offers. And the, you know, we were accepting the offers without knowing that we could fulfill them. And, and, and more and more going deeper. And I was like, did you communicate with one another? Did we talk about you know, who's gonna accept the offers? And they said, no, the offers was flash and go away from the screen. And I was like, why do you think that happens? Well, that's because somebody else in the room is accepting the offer. You know what I mean? So creating a dialogue around it ultimately led us to talking about, does this happen in real life as well? And what's mm -hmm. the impact of that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so something else th that you mentioned in there was also the opportunity to try things out, the opportunity to make mistakes or the opportunity to recognize faults or failures and then act upon them kind of in the second space that is reflective of the workspace, but is uh, for that hour is within this game space. So uh, you're giving people a chance to try something new, that, that ability to make a, a new decision when the same problem comes up that I think is, is particularly powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think experimentation plays a significant role in game design and in game play, uh, mm -hmm. allowing people the opportunity to, to try new behavior, something that they hadn't, especially when they play multiple rounds of the same game, allowing them to correct some behaviors and see, let's experiment with a new behavior, see what happens as a result.
And, and a huge part of that is, is getting to act upon it. I think uh, in designing training experiences, a lot of the information flow or, or the scenarios that come up, the, uh, the, exp the, the way that we deliver that information is very much, here's what you're supposed to be doing, now go do that different thing. When in reality, you need a chance to uh, take on that new idea, to take on that scenario or look at it in a different way and either make a mistake and try something different or realize something that there is just a whole other mindset or a whole other way to approach that problem. Yeah, yeah. Just to add to what you're saying, I think what you're yeah. really talking about here is the consequence of decision. And that's so important for people to see that I've made this decision and the consequence of this decision wasn't productive, wasn't good. And mm -hmm. therefore, I need to change. That change is internal. That shift happens from inside where you start to realize that I did this thing and it didn't work for me. I saw the consequence of it. I'm going to try something else next mm -hmm. time. And also, as, you know, as a side note, as game designers and as learning designers, there's immense responsibility on us because we're creating the neural pathways for people to understand what's good and what's bad. And if we're designing the game right with proper ethics, then we're designing the right kind of neural pathways for people to understand that good behavior will reap and yield good results versus bad behavior will result in something that's counterproductive. I'm wondering if you could shift more into thinking, diving more deeply into game design. Um, one particular uh, aspect of that that I think resonates with our audience is uh, the use of, uh, of characters or avatars. I think what that looks like on the Synthesia side of things is we see a lot of people using avatars and kind of characters and training experiences, but the way that we see them being used, it's it's not as purposeful in game design. It's more of like an engagement trick or something that they slap on the end. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit of what happens when we move into the professional space and we start thinking about designing characters for uh, for training or for learning. How can we bring that? Uh, how can we, I guess, more personalize those uh, those larger than life archetypes that we're all familiar with and get into more of the nitty gritty everyday characters? How, how do you? How can we think about that? Yeah, I mean, really, it's a character map that you've got to build, and that's one of the things that I teach in my game design class as well, where I talk about, you know, think about the different aspects of your own life, you know, start there. And, and what are the different aspects, your relationships, your, your profession, your, um, your hobbies, your preferences, you know, uh, in, in, in a lot of different ways, even your dressing style, and, and look at all of that and now build out detailed stories around each of them. The point is that, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why people skip this step is because it's a lot of work. And it takes time to design a proper character map. But it is so rewarding if you're building a learning experience with characters in it. Uh, you're actually creating a resonance through the, the very simple things that everybody can, can relate to. All of these things add to the storyline and, and leverage tools that are there, you know, personality type uh tools that are there and i you know i don't necessarily be, believe so much in this uh in in the 16 personalities and things like that but i mean those are tools that you can use to build out your characters around and give each one a different different flavor if you will and you'll see what's also interesting is that these characters when you when you view the world through their lens they will also inform the story to a far extent the narrative meaning looking at it from their perspective and saying what would this person do and, and how would they navigate the situation? And this in combination with an understanding of game theory, like Nash's Equilibrium, saying that every person will do what they possibly can to increase their payoff mm -hmm. in any way possible. And that's what we're all doing. We're all trying to increase our payoff, but we just go about it in different ways, which is based on, on our character, our, our personality, our rich relationship choices and in our backstory mm -hmm. and and just for those who are listening we'll be sure to link nash's equilibrium it's certainly new for me as well so we'll be sure to link that in the resources uh for uh, for our conversation today but um i'm curious you know I, I know you have spent a lot of time teaching game design you're familiar with designing the the these really incredible experiences i'm thinking of someone in our uh who's listening right now who might be someone who's on an L&D team 
you know, or they're developing training and it's just them, they're looking to dip their toes in. How do they, how should they, what, what are some small ways that they can start uh, developing characters for their training? You know, what are some basic questions that they could ask? What, what's, what are some basic techniques that they can use? Yeah, I use a number of uh, different tools that I, I have. Um, and I go about it in a couple of different ways. So there is uh, something called charactercreator.org, which is a free tool online. Uh, basically what a character creator does is it, it kind of creates this, this avatar of an individual. You can randomize it as well. And by randomizing it, you're able to see a character in front of you and then let your bias and let your judgment play out as well. Mm. And, and, you know, we always, we always say that, uh, you know, bias and judgment is bad, but it is inherent. It's a part of who we are. Well, so speak to that, you know, let that come out and, and, and label all the things that, that you're, you're thinking about that individual. Get somebody else to do it for the same character and then build out a character over that. That's one way of going about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the visual aid that's giving you personality and giving you character background. The other way to go about it is to draw out a character map and, and you know, put out a lot of different sort of um, segments such as family, uh, profession, background, uh, career choices, mistakes, you know, that, that kind of like serve as baggage that you, you carry with you, you know, and, and hopes and dreams, regrets, motivations, and, and pen them all down and then build out a character that visually represents some aspect of that, right? And, and your choices and, and in the game based on, on how you design uh, the choices that you, you take um, might influence whether the person has a tattoo or whether the person wears a certain kind of clothing or whether the person has uh, glasses or how do, how do they style their hair. And all of that can, can influence each other. So, so there's a couple of the different ways. I've got a set of tools that I'll be happy to share uh, mm -hmm. here. You can append that into the, you know, the resources uh, later on for people who might be interested. What you mentioned, you know, this level of detail, you know, as you're starting to put that together, I'm starting to think about our audience who's building videos for, for training and they're, maybe they're selecting which avatar to choose rather than looking at a series of, I, I think, looking at a series of faces and outfits is helpful but what you're talking about about this slightly deeper level of character development is a way to make your audience uh, understand the the character more or, or read more into the choices that they're making if they're delivering some sort of if you're delivering some sort of training and maybe this character doesn't realize the importance of it security when sending an email if you're doing uh you know some sort of basic uh, computer security training if it's somebody who they uh, who reveals details about themselves that uh, again that idea of connection and and making them uh, feel that experience of somebody else making a mistake it's much more powerful than just saying you know hide make sure you delete personal identifying information from your next excel sheet as an attachment it gives uh, that character maybe it, it helps the person realize okay, that might not be me, but that could be an employee in my company, or that could be somebody that I know. And it just yeah. makes that learning just a little, or that, that realization that this information is important or the actions yeah. that they're seeing play out. It just gives it a little bit more stickiness rather than just your just dry training delivered by this avatar that's speaking to you on camera. And that's so important because, yeah. uh, I mean, we all watch Netflix and and Disney and whatever I mean shows that we spend so many so many hours watching you think about the stuff that you're watching now one of the reasons why you're watching it and why you're hooked is because you resonate with the character because the character is freaking interesting right if you make dumb characters that aren't interesting they they aren't going to be relatable they aren't going to be somebody that they people come back to it's the same reason why you keep going back to to shows because you want to know what this individual is going to do next and and so i want to i want to ask you to take a minute to think about what might have gone into character creation of some of the characters that you love in cinema or in, in tv whatever mm. it is that you do watch and if you put half if not quarter of that kind of effort you'll have a great character build out Mm. Uh, it's uh you know it, everybody has their favorite movies everybody has a place to start so if you're able to identify what characteristics make that character powerful that's already a first step into 
choosing and designing the characters that you're going to use either as your narrators or the, the or facilitators it's it's yeah. a it's a great place to, to begin i want to shift it again into thinking about this idea of designing training experiences a lot of a lot of folks are taking uh have self-directed learning at work or they're uh Maybe you're on the design side and you're designing these, uh, you're designing asynchronous learning, you're designing courses. How can we bring a game designer's mindset and design something that's engaging, but yet also targets performance and behavior change? Consider what are the, what are the limitations of the platform that you're working with? And, and I like to believe that you can create gameful experiences in just about anything. So I built my first game using Microsoft Excel macros and, uh, and WhatsApp. And I use the WhatsApp as the front facing interaction tool with groups. And I use the macro and the Microsoft Excel to display a dashboard on the screen for all the participants who are playing the game. So, so really it's, it's about the interaction, the rules that actually make the game or make an experience gameful, making it mm. meaningful. So those are, those are some things to consider perhaps. Yeah, the, and, and something that you bring up there is, is the idea of interaction. Rather than you know, it's it's not just about telling somebody information all the way through, but looking for opportunities where they can input themselves or they can apply prior experience and really just find ways to engage with the content. I think a lot of what we see and a lot of the the, the content that folks are producing right now is very much just using the platform or the design to deliver information. It's not re, uh, realize new concepts or make connections. That, that idea is missing, I think, from a lot of the training that we've seen and a lot of the content that people design. Something that, that comes to mind for me when it comes to interaction is the role of feedback. You know, how do you, uh, I think feedback in games, it, like that's what makes games interactive. That's yeah. what makes people act differently throughout the game. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the role of feedback in, in, uh, in oh, game, yeah. game design? Yeah. yeah, great question. I mean, I, I, I'm so glad you asked this because that's exactly where this is going. We're talking about feedback. We're talking about having done something and then the game tells you that, you know, yeah, you did that right or you didn't do it right. And it doesn't necessarily tell you it in a, you know, in a correct answer, wrong answer sort of response, right? It tells you it in a, in a very sort of nuanced way. It tells you it in the form of, a, again, going back to that point, consequence of decision, right? Mm. And the consequence itself is a form of feedback that the game gives back to the player to let them know that they're on the right track or that they need to maybe change something about how they're doing it. And, and that's the other piece that I, I always uh, work with and operate with when designing games and when, when also facilitating or using games for learning is I don't give all the information at one go. Uh, I think there are two guiding principles for me. One is tell the player enough to take action right now. All right, that's the first thing. And the other piece is to uh, get them to seek the information as well. So mm -hmm. tell them enough to get them to, to take the action to the very next action. And the second piece is to get them to seek the, the, the next piece of information. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I've, I've built an asynchronous game, which has been played by many, many organizations, Dell, uh, HSBC, Uber, and on. And um, this game is, uh, is a game called Superhero Within. The game opens when you start playing the game. It opens with an intro video, kind of like a, a two minute narrative, which tells the backstory, few characters involved in there. And then it culminates into into you that, you know, the, they're going into a room to meet these these new people who've been uh, who've been onboarded to travel the space. And and right after that, the very next thing you need to know is, is, a, is a character selection page where you're selecting a character, you're giving them a name, you're selecting the team that you're a part of. And then the next thing that they need to know is how to do a mission, right? And so they're going straight into that. So step by step, we're guiding them on what is it the very next thing that you need to know. And we call in the game world, we call it scaffolding. So, so building out a scaffolding. And again, I'm going back to saying, it sounds gonna sound like a broken record, but all of this is gonna take work. 
in design. So take the time to design a meaningful experience. If you, if you spend the time, it's not rocket science. Anybody can do it. You just have to connect with your humanness and understand that this is what it's going to take for an individual to feel engaged at any, any point in time. What is it the next thing that they need to do? You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you talk about the next thing they need to do, that's, I think that's the performance piece where it's, you've given somebody enough information that they can act on it. And then kind of that, uh, just to tie it back to what you're talking about earlier with building autonomy or, or helping them have that aha moment or that realization that's, you have to also simultaneously help them seek out new information. It's you give them something to do, but also give them the curiosity to continue. And, uh, and then they'll, uh, be able to prepare themselves either for the next task that they have to solve and therefore the next action they'll commit to, or they'll be able to uh, work in new or better ways. And then, you know, j just bringing us on home here, you know, you mentioned about doing the work and how important that is. Um, I'm thinking folks who are listening, they're probably thinking this is all fantastic, but where, where do I start now? And so uh, maybe we can tie this all up in a bow. You know, we have a lot of connection between learning and designing games. How can you get started with building these mindsets and techniques into learning design? What are kind of the three steps that somebody who, who's at that first stage, what are the three steps that they can take to start to develop and do that work of coming up with uh, effective mm -hmm. and engaging learning experiences? I would actually go back to the very fundamental design of the magic circle. And, and the magic circle is something that I've talked about extensively in the last few years. Uh, you know, ever since I've understood the concept, I teach it in game design as well, because it's such a core concept. It's so simple that it, it's almost sometimes easy to miss and forget, but it is so fundamental to designing and maybe even getting started. And, and it starts with, there are three elements to create a magic circle. First off, we've got to understand what is a magic circle, right? A magic circle is this imaginary circle inside which gameful experiences happen. So, so imagine a, a soccer field, right? When the players are playing inside the soccer field or the football field, that's the magic circle, right? And sometimes the magic circle expands to the audience who gets involved in the gameplay itself. And sometimes it expands so much that it becomes a global phenomenon where people are plugging in to watch a bunch of people play in that small little stadium, right? And that's the magic circle. So anybody who plugs into that becomes a part, either a spectator or a player in that magic circle. And essentially to make the magic circle happen, there are three very, very specific and simple components that I think are present all around us if we take a look around us. The first is the player, you know? Who is the, who are the players, who's engaging, who's, who is the actor, if you will, okay? The second is the toy or the play thing, all right? And, and that in the, in the case of a football could be the, the ball and, and perhaps the, the, the football field could be an example of the, of the play thing because that's the environment and the, and the tools that they're using to play. And the third is the interaction between these two. So the player, the plaything, what are the rules that are governing this world ultimately create the magic circle? So, so it goes back to what I was saying earlier as well, which is start with your audience. So know who your players are. Start with, you know, who is your audience? Who are you designing this, this environment for? Then know what the plaything is. What is the platform in which you're designing? Whatever it is you're, that you're designing, what are the limitations of that platform? Build game, uh, understand that limitation deeply and then build the interaction between the player and that platform or whatever it is, whether it's a LMS or whether it's, you know, Synthesia or whether it's any Google, Google Sheets for that matter or Excel or it doesn't matter. You can create gameful experiences as long as you engage the player and get them to, to establish a connection with the toy or the plaything, and then build an interaction that ultimately gives you points or helps you progress from one stage to the next. Those are the rules, the interaction, the third piece of the equation. So three things. I, yeah, I love this idea of a magic circle and, and kind of you step into, whether it's your game world or your learning world or, or however you're defining that magic circle, because I think when people encounter training and uh, learning experiences in the in the workday, it just kind of blends in with everyday things that, that work that you have to do. But if you're thinking about 
designing training as stepping into, let's say, I don't know if I, I'm going too far out, Rosen, but stepping into the training circle, you have to know who the, you know, your audience is, who's going to be taking this training. You have to know kind of what are the features, what are the mechanics of the training platform you're using? And then that's, then that third piece that you're saying is where the magic happens, I think, is the design of the interaction. So you have to get the, the person familiar with the environment first before you start asking them to do things so that they know kind of where they are, what the rules are and what they, what, uh, you know, kind of what are, uh, what is the opportunity for them? You know, where can they make mistakes? Where can they learn something new? What can they action? Yeah. And once people are in it, it you know, they, they are in and incredible things happen as a result. Yeah. But once people understand how to play and when, once they buy into the interaction and they see the result, the feedback coming back to them that, oh, I'm gaining points, I'm unlocking abilities, I'm moving ahead and I'm scoring higher on the leaderboard. The leaderboard also serves a purpose. It's not just some, some random, you know, conspicuous thing that's just been designed. It's actually something that's serving a, a larger purpose to let you know where you stand in the grand scheme of things. Love it. I, it's just a, a nice, there's so many things that we can talk more about, you know, whether that's feedback or I'm still wondering, you know, what else we could talk about with characters and game design, but I can't thank you enough for your time, Mosin. We've got a lot to munch on here uh, and really just thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to see what's coming next for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's a, it's a delight. I love Synthesia. It's a, it's a tool that I, I love using and I'm, I'm delighted that I'm able to connect with you and talk to your audience. I appreciate you stopping by.